tragic moments in history, the abandoned citizens of Elysia. In 52 BC, Gaul was set alight. Julius Caesar's legions were facing an uprising across the region, which threatened to erase gains from six years of hard-fought campaigning. The revolt was led by Vercingetorix, a young Arverni nobleman who was able to match Caesar's own cunning and determination. The two would clash decisively at the Siege of Alesia, where the ultimate fate of both sides hung in the balance. Overshadowed by these massive historical headlines would be the tragic tale of the city's citizens, who found themselves abandoned by both leaders. Between a rock and a hard place Vercingetorix and approximately 80,000 of his soldiers occupied the hilltop town. They were quick to send out messages calling for help before the 12 Roman legions with 60,000 men were in position. Caesar elected to starve out the defenders and established a set of encircling fortifications meant to completely cut off their connection to the outside world. Inside Alesia, the Gauls were in a terrible position. They had limited supplies which would quickly be depleted, but had no idea when or even if a relief force would arrive. Their only option was to find a way to make supplies last as long as possible, and hope that this brought enough time for reinforcements to break the siege. To fail in this measure would mean the end of the revolt and the ultimate fall of Gaul. Vercingetorix first began by collecting all the grain in town and establishing a system of rations. However, as the days rolled by, it became increasingly obvious that the math was not adding up. More desperate measures would have to be taken to survive the blockade. A Gallic council was called to discuss the matters. It was resolved that all those whose age or bodily infirmities incapacitated them from active service should immediately quit the city. The yet more draconian measure of resorting to cannibalism was kept only as a last resort. At the same time, the legions also faced their own dilemma. Scouts reported that a massive Gallic relief force of around 120,000 was indeed on its way. The Romans were now under the very real threat of being surrounded themselves. To meet this army, Caesar had a second set of outer-facing walls built just behind his first line of fortifications. It would be a fight for their lives, as defeat would likely mean slaughter. Even if some managed to escape back to Rome, this would be the political death sentence for their leader. Caesar was not about to let this happen. Both sides were determined it would be victory at all costs. The lives of the non-combatants would be spent to achieve this end. The fate of Alesia's citizens The women, children, elderly and infirm were banished from Alesia. They shuffled in a long column towards the enemy's lines, hoping that they might be met with the clemency Caesar had shown in the past. However, the general could be every bit as cruel as he was merciful. When the citizens of Alicia arrived outside the Roman lines, their piteous appeals fell on deaf ears. Granting them safe passage would break the blockade, allowing information to flow between the two Gallic forces and creating an opportunity for an attack. The other option of taking the civilians as prisoners was not viable. Though they might fetch a good price in the slave markets, neither food nor guards could be devoted to secure them as prizes of war, given the looming threat. Caesar gave the order that none were to be admitted. The citizens of Alicia were now utterly and completely abandoned. They could neither pass through the Roman lines nor return to their own. Both generals were ironclad in their determination, unwilling to take the strategic penalty of providing aid. The populace had become a pawn in a larger game. And so, they remained trapped in no man's land by two leaders facing off in a battle of wills. Here, they were left to starve in full view of both armies. The Final Days History records little of their ultimate fate, but we will do our best to reconstruct those final, tragic moments. We must imagine that upon being denied access by the Romans, there must have been a sense of shock. This was likely tempered by the thought that they were avoiding the embrace of slave masters and could return to Elysia to await the outcome of the siege in solidarity with their countrymen. However, when they found the town gates barred, 
unimaginable horror must have seized them. A cold dread rising from the depths of their stomachs, followed by a sudden rush of heat as panic came on. What happened as news spread in a wave of shouts through the crowd? Did they try to force their way in, climb the walls, or implore with wails that the children at least be saved? Perhaps some attempted to return to the Roman lines, or make an escape only to be thrown back with force. As night brought a close on the drama of the day, the townsfolk would have made camp, hoping that by dawn the nightmare would pass. On the second day, we can imagine that the citizens once again implored both sides to take them in, but to no avail. As the hot September sun intensified with each passing hour, so too did the stress and desperation. Darkness again came, bringing an end to the heat, but not the suffering. The following day would have seen continued attempts by the optimistic or desperate members of the group to negotiate with either side. Those with enough strength may have gone out to forage for roots, nuts, and small animals to eat, while the weak remained where they had been that night, praying to their gods through dried and cracked lips. Some small amount of relief may have come from charitable Gauls in Elysia who tossed supplies over the walls, or opportunistic legionaries who traded their rations for valuables at extortionate rates. By nightfall, however, the citizens would have been deep in the grips of hunger. The group likely circled around their fires and discussed the very real fact that they could not all make it through this trial. Perhaps lots were drawn or volunteers stepped forth to give the last bits of food to those most likely to survive. Suicide may have been favoured by some who wished to end the suffering on their own terms. And so, like the leaves of fall, the citizens of Alicia withered away. Caesar's commentaries state that Gallic reinforcements did finally arrive, though we are left guessing as to the exact timeline of events. Did the army make it while the townsfolk were still alive, or had they all been claimed by exposure and hunger? We do not know. However, what we do know is that the ensuing hard-fought battle between the Gauls and Romans was a desperate, bloody affair that resulted in a victory for the legions. The large Gallic army was forced to disperse without breaking the siege, and Vercingetorix was finally forced to admit defeat. Caesar is said to have avoided reprisals against those who surrendered. In this case, we can only hope that the citizens of Alicia who survived were treated generously. Remembering the Tragedy Some may find the reconstruction we have presented to be overly gratuitous, yet this is how we must treat history, as a story with dimension and colour rather than a black and white timeline. These were real people with real lives. They had hopes, dreams, fears and pains. They lived and breathed just as we do. If we remove the tragedy from history, then no costs can be seen to outweigh the benefits of decisions. We are reduced to a past where the ends always justify the means, a past where might makes right. The fate of Alicia's citizens is treated with a single line in Caesar's commentaries. How will our descendants look back on the history of our generations? Will those of the 22nd century read about a Second World War devoid of the Holocaust? We must not forget, so that we will not be forgotten. If you found this topic interesting, check out these related videos about our fascinating past. Be sure to like and subscribe for more history, and check out our description for ways to support the channel. Thanks for watching.